Hi everyone and welcome to the channel. If we've not met before, my name's Richard and I've been producing videos on YouTube on the electronics repair for two and a half years now. And this is a, another project, a different project for me. So at the request and through some discussion with a lot of subscribers, people are asking me, hey Rich, why don't you teach electronics from the beginning? So I thought it's a very good idea. No messing around, let's start, okay. So first, let me just say, this is not going to be a heavy on theory introduction to electronics. This is going to involve a lot of practical, there'll be some practical examples in every video. Light on math, we need a little bit of math and full enough most of it is in this first video. That's just the way it is, yeah, but there's not much mathematics in here. This is really based on practical experimentation and demonstration, okay. For those of you who enjoy the repair videos, they will continue as normal. This series of videos, Learn Electronics on Learn Electronics Repair, will have its own playlist. So those of you who want to follow the series, you can also easily do so. Just go to the playlist. I'll link that in the video description. But for now, this is the first episode. So where do we begin? Well, the beginning. So welcome to my piece of graph paper and a pen. You won't find any fancy animations in this series of videos. It's going to be done the old fashioned way, but I think this is probably the best way. This is the way it was taught to me and it worked on me. So if it worked on me, it hopefully works on other people as well. So let's start off first. The fundamental of electronics, electricity. What is electricity? Well, based on the modern understanding of electricity, it's actually the flow of electrons in a material. So the theory goes, we have in any material, atoms, and around the atoms are electrons, varying numbers depending on the material, we'll put eight on ours, and so on. So these are the electrons effectively in orbit or a cloud around the atom. And in some materials, these electrons can move from one atom to another more easily than others okay so if we apply a force to this which we'll call a battery why not we'll call it a battery we apply a battery to here this is a symbol for a battery by the way and we'll be looking at symbols through this so there's your first one battery okay we connect a battery on here this effectively contains chemicals that cause an excess of electrons to sit around on this end of the battery basically a pool of spare electrons looking for something to do yeah so when we connect this to our material electrons will effectively push their way in here so they'll jump onto the first atom and because this is a conductor that means it passes electricity easily when the electron jumps on here another one will be forced out onto there and that will put an excess of electrons in here, so it will force another one to jump off here onto here and so on. So the electrons effectively jump from one atom to the other. And that is electricity. Now, I say on modern understanding, that is electricity. If we went into the murky world of quantum physics, where nothing is ever quite what it seems. You may find that is not totally the truth, but you know, for this course on electronics, that is good enough. So we will stick with that as the theory or the principle of electricity. Now, as I mentioned, some materials have atoms in them with electrons around that easily move from one atom to another. Some materials have electrons that are basically locked in place just due to the structure of the atom. And in those materials, this process will not happen or it happens at a very, very low level. And then there are some substances in between. So the substances which pass electrons very easily are generally metals. Copper is a good example. So copper passes electrons very easily through its structure. That means this is a very good conductor of electricity. Other examples, gold, silver, very good conductors. There are some metals which are not very good conductors. And then we have insulators. 
An insulator is the opposite to a conductor. So again, we have a material and it's again consisted with atoms, with electrons around them. But due to the chemical makeup, the elements inside this, the electrons are basically fixed in place around that atom and don't want to move to another one. So if we do the same thing and we apply a force to here through our battery, although it's pushing on the first row of atoms, if you like, nothing wants to move. So this pool of electrons sort of sitting on this end of the battery can't go anywhere no current can flow and this is called an insulator a good example of an insulator wood although if it's wet it isn't quite okay plastic rubber and you'll see these are basically non-metallic substances which are very good insulators now, in between these two types of substance, we get another one, which is a kind of a, a middle for diddle. Yeah, it's somewhere between the two. So, same thing, atoms and the electrons around them. And these are not free to move like these, but they're not locked in place like these are either. They will move with a bit of reluctance, but they will move. So, when we connect our force, our battery, uh, may the force be with the substance yeah. we connect this to here the electrons will go they're a bit like reluctant but they they go with the flow shall we say yeah so these things are conductors they're just not very good conductors and they have a name and they're effectively called resistors or resistive or resistant substance i've got resistive for now these are resistive so Electrons will flow through them. They're just not as enthusiastic as these substances which conduct freely. And those are really your three types of substance that you find when electricity is concerned. Personally, I think the easiest way to understand this is with an analogy. And this is the one that I was taught and it's something I've never forgotten. So the analogy is to use water and water pipes to understand this better. So if we take, for example, a tank full of water with a pipe, okay? one tank full of water, and we have a pipe coming out of here, downwards, what will happen? Well, we all know that the water will flow through the pipe and water will come out of here, okay? How much water will come out of the pipe? Well, that depends on two things, actually. If we want to get more water out of the pipe for a given capacity of water, we could use a wider pipe. If the pipe is wider, more water will come out. That's fairly obvious, I think. But there's another way we can get more water out of this pipe by still using the same width pipe that we originally had. And this is not so complicated either. We have our water pipe, same width as that one. We have our tank full of water. Then we put some pressure on it. So we take a plunger here. and we push down on this plunger and the harder we push on the plunger the more water will come out of the pipe that's fairly obvious also yeah well this analogy very easily demonstrates a very important principle of electricity and electronics and the principle is this there are three things which affect the amount of water that is flowing Okay, if we make the pipe wider, more water will flow. The width of the pipe is the resistance. 
So the narrower the pipe, the more resistive it is to the flow of water. The wider the pipe, the less resistive. So the width of the pipe, we can say that is equivalent to the resistance of the material we have here. Insulator, conductor or something in between. The other factor is the amount of pressure we put on here. So the more pressure we put on the water, the greater the flow will be for the same width of pipe. So the width stays the same from here to here. The resistance is the same, but by applying more pressure, we get more flow. Okay, so that is the other factor, the pressure. Okay, and the last factor, well, really it's what we've just talked about. It's the flow, it's the amount of flow. So we have pressure, water flow, resistance. Now we can directly translate this into this. So in an electrical circuit, the pressure is called volts. The voltage or volts, the amount of volts, is equivalent to the amount of pressure we put on the sponge. Okay? The width of the pipe, the resistance, well, I actually used the word before, this is the resistance in the electric circuits. So the higher the resistance, the less the flow. And the flow is called current. And it's quite nice because water flows and currents and electricity flows and currents. So that one is easy to translate between the two. Now there's one important way in which this analogy of water flow does not represent this electrical flow or flow of electricity. And that is simple once you explain it. So what happens in all of these instances? Well, eventually, we end up with a big puddle of water over here. Yeah, we end up with a big puddle of water. The amount of time it takes to get a big puddle of water and the size of the puddle will depend on the width, the pipe and the pressure. Yeah, that sets how much current flows, how big is the puddle. But with electricity, it doesn't work like that. You don't end up, if we connect this battery, which has an excess of electrons on this plate, which easily flow through the copper, they don't like make a big pool of electrons on your desk. So you won't end up with like a, a big pool of electrons lying on the desk. Yeah. It doesn't work like that. And the reason it doesn't work is the electrons have to return back to the source. Where the water doesn't have to, these do have to. And that's the difference. So with electricity, for the electrons to flow, we need what is called a circuit. And the circuit is a path, effectively from this plate on the battery where there's lots of electrons sitting around through the conductor or the resistive material back to the positive end of the battery where there is a lack of electrons. And what gradually happens, all the electrons on here gradually go all the way through here and all end up here. And you'll reach a point eventually where there's the same amount of electrons here as there is here. And the battery goes flat and the current stops. So that is the big difference, but the analogy is still good. And it's very good when I tell you the next most important thing about this. And this is the relationship between pressure, resistance, and current. Or should I say volts, resistance, and current. And this brings us to the most important part of this installment of this lesson, yeah? And this is the relationship between these three factors. Now, the relationship was first discovered by a German guy, Jörg Ohm, in 1826, and he published this in 1827. And this is called Ohm, which is his name, Ohm's Law. And Ohm's Law is very simple. And the best way to represent it is with a triangle. V I, R. Now you're going to ask me straight away, what's I? Yeah, if you might think, well, V is volts and R is resistance. Where did I come into all this? Yeah, well, although 
Jorg Ohm was actually a German guy. Strangely enough, current was already known about before he formulated this all. It must have been if you think about it. And I actually comes from French and it's intensity. Probably spelt wrong because it's in French, something like that. De current. The intensity of current. And that's what the I is in the formula. And this is a formula. And it's so elegant, this. Let me show you. If you have a circuit where you have some source of voltage and you have a resistor, look, we've drawn another symbol, yeah? Resistor. I'll draw it even better. There you go. Resistor, yeah? This is a symbol for a resistor. So we have some source of voltage. We have a resistor. And we complete the circuit, as we just mentioned. We have a circuit, yeah? If we want to know what the value of the resistor is, and we already know the volts and the current. So if you want to work out any one, you need to know the other two. So what's the resistance? Well, if we cover that with a finger, you get volts over current, V over I. So if we take V and divide it by I, and we can measure these with our meter, we can work out what R is. If you want to know what the current will be, put your finger over I, measure volts and resistance and you can work out the current and if you want to know what the voltage is applied to a circuit all you need to do is measure the resistance and the current and that will tell you what the volts are these three things have units of measurement okay volts is easy because volts is in volts Resistance is in Ohm's. Obviously, Ohm thought, well, the best thing to call that is my own name, and why not? He did discover this principle. So, and we don't put an apostrophe in it. Ohm's is resistance. So, resistance is measured in Ohm's. The more Ohm's, the more resistive it is. And current, well, this is named after another guy named Ampere, and we measure current in amps. Okay? So that is the maths for today. We'll look at this much more later in more detail, but for now, I think I want to demonstrate something to you much more interesting. And this is another difference between that analogy with the water and an actual resistor. We used a wider or a narrower pipe and that passed more or less water. Our resistor contains a material which resists the flow of electrons to some extent or other. But the resistor isn't quite like the water pipe. There's another fundamental difference. And in this case, this is more like, let's think of it this way. We have a hill, a mountain, okay? And on the hill, we have a car, okay? I probably can't draw a very good car, but this is like a, a symbolic of a car. Yeah, it looks nothing like one, but there you go a bit more like a car. The car's rolling down the hill, okay? If you want to resist the movement, what do you do? You put your foot on the brakes. So you apply the brakes and that puts a pad against the disc of the brake to slow down the movement. Two things happen. One, the car slows down. And the other one, the brakes get hot. Yeah, the brake pads get hot. If you ride the brakes down that hill, by the time you get to the bottom, you can probably smell them burning. So that's because the brakes are effectively using friction to resist the movement of the car. And the energy that was in that car moving downhill has to go somewhere and it's converted into heat. This is why your brake pads fry. Well, the same applies with the resistor. When the resistor in a circuit is resisting the flow of electrons, it causes, if you like, electrical friction. And although electrical friction, the resistance to the flow of electrons, might not sound like very much, I mean, electrons are pretty small, yeah, and uh, they probably don't take much resisting. Well, 
it's actually very real. So as you pass current through a resistor, the resistor gets hotter. And this is something I want to demonstrate to you right now. We're ready to go. In future lessons, we'll explain how this circuit is connected up. But for now, all we need to know is that this meter is measuring the voltage across the resistor. And this one is measuring the current through the resistor. The voltage is set to read in volts. So that's 0 0.05 of a volt at the moment coming from my power supply. And this is the current in milliamps. A milliamp is a thousandth of an amp. So if we get a one here, that's one thousandth of an amp. Let's apply some voltage and we can see Ohm's law at work. So if I increase the voltage to 10 volts. Okay, we get to 10 volts or very close to it. Okay, we're close to 10 volts. Now you'll see at 10 volts, the current is 0.986 milliamps, almost one milliamp. That's because this resistor is 10,000 ohm. Okay, so 10 volts gives about a thousandth of an amp. If we go to one volt, that would be if this will even read it so well, we can have a work. Yeah, it's just about reading it. So we've got one volt and we've now got a ten thousandth of an amp. So you can see there's a direct relationship between the volts and the ohms here. If I, for example, go to 20 volts. And you see how the two meters are climbing together. It's just a decimal point at a different place. So at 20 volts there's about 2000 milliamps. The reason it's not exact is because A, the wires have a little bit of resistance and B, these resistors are made within a tolerance. So they're not an exaggerated value. They can be plus or minus a percentage depending on the type of the resistor. I'm sure you can see that is the case. And if I take my power supply up to the maximum, 30 volts, you see three. Yeah. Now I said that the resistor will get hot in resisting the flow of electricity it gets hot so let's take this back down to 10 volts and let's see if our resistor is actually warming up okay so we can see our resistor there on the thermal camera okay let's turn up the voltage and the current so we now have 14 volts and 1.4 milliamps will go up more and you'll see the resistor is warming up at 19 volts so the higher the current the higher the voltage the resistor is warming up it's not getting very hot this resistor it's maybe 50 degrees something like that 56 57 so although it's getting warm, it's not getting very hot. What happens if we use a lower value resistor? Well, we know from the previous description, the lower the resistance, the more current should flow for a given voltage. Let's see what happens. Okay. If you're wondering, by the way, this is just supporting the thing off the desk. These two are the actual electrical connections. This is just physically holding it in place. Let's have a look at this one. So at the moment we have no volts, no amps. So there's no voltage, no current, and the resistor is there. Very dark, it's cold, okay. Let's put some current through this one. So you now see we have two volts and two milliamps. This is a 1000 ohm resistor, so it will effectively pass 10 times as much current is the 10,000 ohm for the given voltage. And it's still cold, let's go for a bit more. So let's go up say to five volts, five milliamps. And now you can see this is getting quite warm. Yeah, uh, let's go a bit more than that. And now it's getting warm, very warm compared to the other one. I'll keep increasing the voltage. So we have 11 volts, 11 milliamps. Keep going up. Yeah, you can see the resistor is getting hot now at 15 volts, but more. So at 30 volts, that's getting very warm now, okay? 
So you can see that with a higher current, the resistor gets hotter. That was up at about 70 degrees or so, yeah, it was very hot. I've now switched to the current off, so it's cooling down. So let's try again now with a lower value resistor. Well, this is a 10 ohm resistor. So using the ohm's law, I equals V over R, voltage is 10 volts, for example, and this would be 10 ohms, for example, the current would be one amp. So this will pass quite a lot of current. So this should get hotter than the previous one. You'll also notice this is a little bit larger than the other one. This is actually a higher wattage or higher power resistor. It's like having larger brake pads on your car. This is designed to take a bit more abuse, basically, yeah, a bit more heavy braking. You can see at the moment it's down to about 28 degrees. So let's put some voltage on the circuit again. So we now have 1.4 which you see the 102 milliamps so it's passing quite a bit of current let's increase the power some more okay is it getting warm yeah yeah it's getting warm now let's go some more and you can see that it's getting hot now my meter in milliamps has gone to overload so that's just telling me that it can't read any higher than that so instead of measuring milliamps i'm going to measure amps don't worry about the Multimeters, if you're not used to using a multimeter, we'll be talking about this in a later video, how to use the multimeter, how to connect it, okay? But I've now set it to the amps range, so it can read higher comments. Let's go some more. So that's one volt in, okay, 0.1 of an amp, we'd expect. We now have four volts in, 4.3, 0.43 of an amp. Let's go some more. Now you can see on the thermal camera, this is getting really quite hot now. Okay, let's keep increasing the voltage. Oh, and look what's happening. Look what happened there, yeah. Oh, and it's even set on fire. But you'll see now the current has gone to zero. That's because the resistor reached the point at which it can no longer handle any more current. It couldn't get any hotter. It just burnt, okay? That is a very important principle. Now, let's just have a look at that on a piece of paper. Voltage. Oh, look what's happening. Look what happened there, yeah. Oh, and it's even set on fire. But you'll see now the current. So, what happened to our resistor? Well, we all saw what happened to it. This is what's left of it. So, we can see that the resistor effectively self-destructed or rather was destroyed by the current passing through it okay the current got too high for this resistor to handle now this brings us to another important equation and this is the last one for this video and this is also very simple and this explains why did the resistor burn we saw in that experiment that as we increase the voltage across a resistor the current increased so for a fixed value of resistance more volts is more current we saw that we also saw that there was a relationship between the volts resistance and current so if i use a resistor 10 times larger than a previous one 10 times as many ohms i got 10 times less current for the same voltage so we saw that demonstrated quite nicely in that experiment but what you probably noticed was the one that set on fire why did it set on fire well the brakes yeah like the brakes on the car so there's a formula that specifies this there's a few ways to write this i write it this way i'll show you one of the others but do it however you wish yeah watts equals volts times current 
and watts is the power, the energy. This is sometimes known as P equals U times I and a few other combinations, yeah? These different combinations of letters, by the way, depend on where you live. Different countries, different regions, different languages even, use different letters. Don't worry if you prefer to write it another way. You are not wrong, you're not right. I'm not wrong and I'm not right. It's just as a native English person, this is the way I was taught it, okay? Well, whether you call it watts or P, it's the power. And the resistor can only handle so much before it sets on fire. And you can see, as I increase the voltage, the current increased until it reached the point it can no longer withstand it. And it went up very nicely, I think. I hope you are. I liked that, yeah? So let's leave that there at the end. That's all the maths we need. The next few videos will contain no new mathematics, but we might use this a little bit more to explain a few things. But we will not be adding any more mathematical formulas next time, guys. It's going to be much more practical, because I hope that's what you enjoy the most. And I hope that's what teaches you the most. So for the next instalment then, I'll ask you a question now and we'll look at the answer the next time. So, we discussed that electric current is the flow of electrons. Yeah, this, the flow of electrons in the material, a piece of wire. Yeah, and that the electrons go from the negative terminal of the battery because the electrons are negatively charged from out to the positive. So, if that is the case, why does current flow from positive to negative? Uh, why does current flow from positive to negative? We all know it does that. Uh, when electrons flow the opposite way. Okay, you won't have to think about that for too long. I'll be back soon for another video just like this in this series. Let me know in the comments, guys, what you think. And if you like this, we'll do plenty more until you understand electronics thoroughly. Ciao for now.